We're going to be looking today at this seventh chapter of Matthew, and we're going to be asking the question, what kind of home are you building? And we're going to be looking specifically at verses 24 through 27, and it is our prayer that our time spent together this morning will be very profitable to you, and that we might offer God the worship that is due Him. Somebody has observed in days gone by that as the home goes, so goes the nation. And if that be the case, and I believe it is, the conclusion would be that our nation is in trouble. Why? Because the home is troubled. There are many of us that when we survey this great country that we see, that there are many homes that are facing dire problems. And so I think it's only right for us to be able to ask that question, what kind of home are you building? Because truly, as the home goes, so goes the nation. And there are really two possibilities. First of all, we could strive to build a Christian home. Or secondly, we could have a crumbling home. Let's think for a moment about what it means to have a Christian home. I would submit to you this morning that a Christian home is a sturdy home. And there are many reasons for that. But ultimately, if... If you wanted to just boil it all down and just make one statement, it would be this, that a Christian home has been correctly built, and that's why it's a sturdy home. Here's what the psalmist, who said in the long ago, he said, except the Lord build the house, they labor in vain that build it. Psalm 127, verse 1. Here's what Jesus said in Matthew 7, 24 and 25, that therefore whosoever heareth these sayings of mine and doeth them, that's the very important part, right? I will liken him unto a wise man who built his house upon a rock and the rains descended and the floods came and the winds blew and beat upon that house and it fell not. For why? Because it was founded upon a rock. How can you, how can I build a Christian home? Well, one of the key ingredients that leads to the kind of home that God would be pleased is, as I said just a moment ago, that a Christian home has been correctly built. And so first and foremost, we think about the apex of the home. For sure, it is granted that the Lord is the foundation, the sure, solid foundation upon which we should build our homes. You might agree with that. Now, the psalmist again said, except the Lord build the house, those who labor, labor in vain. What we want to do is to strive to the best of our ability to build our homes on the Lord. But we also have to understand that we have to have the right apex. I think about the importance of of, of a good roof, right? A good roof. You know, six years ago, we had the the roof replaced on this building, and it just now finally, six years later, got to where it doesn't leak. There needs to be a good roof. I mean, because when you think about it, uh, of course, it only leaks when it rains. But who wants a leaking roof? We need to have a good roof on our house. Then ultimately, you're going to have to be exposed to that inclement weather. And a lot of other problems will come if you don't. When we talk about God being at the apex of our home, what we are saying is that God is over our home and that he is in complete control. And there are reasons for that. Number one, 
Those who have God at the apex of their home have the right pattern for their home. The pattern that I'm talking about is called the Bible, the Word of God. Listen again to what Jesus said. He says, Therefore, whosoever heareth these sayings of mine and doeth them, you see, it's not, it's not just hearing what Jesus has to say, but doing what Jesus said that is most important. A wise person hears and listens to what God's, God is saying in his word and what he has revealed and does them. Those of us who want to have a successful home, if we want to have the kind of home that the Lord would have us to, to have, that it would please him, we will put into practice his word. We understand that this is the rule or the standard that should really govern our home. Paul said, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom, Colossians 3.16. It was the apostle Paul who said in 2 Timothy 3.16 and 17 that all scripture is given by inspiration to God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness so that you and I as the men of God will be completely furnished unto all good works. Very important, isn't it? You see, God's word is profitable only if we use it, right? It has to be implemented into our home life if we are to be successful. And then I think about what Isaiah said in Isaiah 34 and 16, when he said, Seek ye out of the book of the Lord and read. Very important, isn't it? Those of us who have been, that have God as the apex of our home, we understand that this book that we call the Bible is the pattern. It's the pattern. It's the book that governs our home life. It's not what television, it's not what the mainstream media says, it's not what the latest magazine on the rack says, it, but rather it's what God says. On Judgment Day, Jesus is not going to ask you, what was it that you read in the People magazine? What was it that was in the National Enquirer? Do they even have the National Enquirer anymore? I don't know. But <laughs> you can tell I don't read that. But he's not going to ask that. He's going to say, did you hear what I said? And did you do what I said? You see, that's the important part. You know, one of the, I mean, we, we talk about the pattern for the home, but what about the purpose for the home? Look at how many families today in our society and in our country that are floundering, right? I mean, look at all the problems that exist within the, the framework, framework of the American family. You know, one of the problems is that there are a lot of people in our society today that do not understand the purpose of life. The purpose of life. Look how, how many homes today are f focusing on anything and everything, but they exclude the most important thing. What is that most important thing? It's God. It's God. Very important. Look at Solomon. You know, we talk about people learning from history. So that uh, we don't repeat history, although we keep doing it, don't we? Now, someone has well said that if there is anything that we have ever learned from history, is that we have not learned from history. And now we have people wanting to erase history. And so you go back, you look at Solomon. Solomon was the wisest man of his day. He enjoyed the tremendous wealth that was given him. He was a very famous man. He was a very powerful man. He had everything that the human heart, physically and materially speaking, could ever want. But his conclusion was something that was very interesting towards the end of his life. That the most important thing to life is not what a man wears on his back. 
It's not where he lives. It's not what brings him physical gratification. It's God. He said, let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter. Fear God and keep his commandments, for this is the whole duty of man. The whole existence of man is to fear God. Trust God. Right? To ultimately bring him the honor and the glory that he deserves. The whole existence. Isaiah talks about that in Isaiah 43.1. How we have been created to bring God glory. There are a lot of homes today that lack purpose. And, and we see homes today floundering and faltering because, number one, they lack the right pattern. But now, number two, they lack purpose. When we talk about a home that has been built correctly, it has the right pattern. It is a purposeful home. And then number three, it's a prayerful home. Right? How important is prayer in your home? Have you thought about that? Jesus said that men ought always to pray and not to faint, Luke 18, 1. It was Paul that said that we are to pray without ceasing, 1 Thessalonians 5 and verse 17. And then he also writes in Colossians 4, 2 to continue in prayer and watch in the same with thanksgiving. Think about how important prayer was to Jesus the Christ, the very Son of God. We are to pattern ourselves after His life. Very much so. Peter said that we are to follow in His steps. That is, if you want a home, a good home, life, then pray. Those of us who appreciate the very privilege and the power of prayer, we will be praying as a family. And we ought to be on bended knees praying to Jehovah God regularly. I, I think about those homes that stay together it's because they pray together. We need to be a praying group of people, don't we? Very much so. And again, we think about the plight of our nation, right? And the foundations that are crumbling around us. What we want to do is build our homes Correctly, we want to have God at the apex of our home. And if he is at the apex of our home, we will have the right pattern. We will have the right purpose. And we will also be prayerful. And then finally, we will offer him the praise. That's it. He gets the praise. It's not about me. It's not about you. It's about God. That's it. And so Christian homes understand the importance of worshiping God regularly. That's why we need to get back and coming to worship as safely as possible, where we can look back and reflect upon what the psalmist said in Psalm 95, verse 6, when he said, O come, let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord, our maker. Jesus said, God is is spirit. He's a spirit, and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. I will grant you that since we have had this pandemic, that Christian homes and far too many are suffering because of the neglect of worship, of coming together. You see, worship is vitally important to our spiritual well-being and our welfare. It affords us the opportunity to bow in the very presence of God, to give Him the homage, to give Him the glory that He is rightfully due. One of the byproducts of worship is edification, the, the building up of one another. That is why it's so wonderful for us to be able to meet at least once again as the family of God each Sunday morning. And hopefully down the road where we can meet again on Sunday nights. Even though we still cannot shake hands and hug and rub elbows together. That's why 
the Hebrew writer was talking about in Hebrews 10, 25, when he said, not forsake the assembly of ourselves together as the manner of some is, but exhorting one another, right? And, this, and so much the more as you see the day approaching. We talked about the apex of the home, but what about the arrangement of the home? There are really two factors here to, when we talk about the arrangement of the home. First of all, we stress the orderliness of the home. Every home has to have order. God is a God of order. I think about the New Testament church and in New Testament worship where Paul said to let all things be done decently and in order, 1 Corinthians 14, 40. We talk about the Christian home where a lot of homes today are in a state of disorder, if you will. Disorder. And so what we want to have is a state of order. When you talk about the arrangement for the home, first of all, we have to appreciate the fact that God has designated the husband to be the head of the wife. Not a dictator. He's not to rule or to reign as a tyrant, but he's to be the spiritual leader in the home. When Paul had wrote to the church in Corinth in 1 Corinthians eleven three, he said, but I would have you know that the head of every man is Christ, and the head of the woman is the man, and the head of Christ is God. In Ephesians 5, 22 and 23, Paul had stressed the importance of wives being in subjection under their husbands as unto the Lord. He goes on to say, for the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, and he is the savior of the body. This spiritual leader in the home He's not to be a dictator, but the husband and the wife, they complement each other. Isn't that the, the wonderful relationship that God has already brought together from the, from the first time that he brought Adam and Eve together? A wonderful complement that works in a cooperative manner with one another. There's a system of love and the support that undergirds that relationship. And if the husband is doing what God has set forth for him to do in his role, then the wife will be more likely to fulfill her role in the home as well. There has to be orderliness. And there also has to be obedience in the home. You know, one of the things that I think our country is sadly lacking in is obedience in the home. I mean, just look at some of the children in our schools across this country even today and look at the problems that the school administrators are having and teachers are having. Why is that such a problem? Why is that that the kids today seem to be out of control? They're unruly. They talk back to their teachers and to their administrators. Why is it that there's no fear in their eyes? is because there's a lack of respect and obedience in the home. The authoritative forces speak in detail of why it's this way. It's because the mama and the daddy have not implemented a code of discipline in the home. What is it that Solomon said? Spare the rod and spoil the child, Right? Here's what Paul said in Ephesians 6, 1. He said, children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. It is right for children to obey their parents in the Lord. And he talks about honoring our father and our mother. What about the right kind of respect? You know, sometimes I hear children talk back to their parents, and, and I, I hear them saying ugly remarks or just letting them have it. And I, I wonder who's in control here. It's not the parents, is it? It's really a case of the tail wagging the dog instead of the dog wagging the tail. What we need today are parents who will enforce a code of discipline in the home. You know, the Bible talks about how the Lord loves those whom he chastens. If we love our children, we will discipline them. 
There are a lot of parents today that really have the idea that if they spank their children, that their ch children might turn on them. Listen, if you don't spank your children, you're going to have terrible problems. Now, we're talking about within reason, you see. Within reason. I've said this many times that if children do not respect the authority in the home, they will never respect the authority in the school, on the job, even to those who enforce the laws of the land. And if they don't even respect that, how are they going to respect even the respect that God should have as well? The respect of the authority of the scriptures. And so orderliness and obedience. But a third component of a Christian home has to be affection. Genuine affection. There is the charge to love. Now, the Bible says in Ephesians 5 and verse 25, Husbands, love your wives even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it. And Paul said in Titus 2, 5, that the older women, that they may teach the young women to be sober, to love their husbands and to love their children, to be discreet, chaste, keepers at home, good, obedient to their own husbands, that the word of God be not blasphemed. There is this relationship that exists within the framework of the home in which the husband and the wife mutually love one another and respect one another. It is this agape sacrificial love and it takes both individuals, the husband and the wife, giving 100% every day. Those of us who are husbands, if we love as Christ loved the church, then our wives will be more likely to follow our lead. And then the characteristics of love. You go to 1 Corinthians 13, the very chapter of love, where Paul talks about how that charity, that is love, suffereth long and is kind. Charity envieth not. Charity vaunteth not itself, is not puffed up doth not behave itself unseemly, seeketh not her own, is not easily pre provo uh, provoked, thinketh no evil, rejoiceth not in iniquity, but rejoices in the truth, beareth all things, believeth all things, hopeth all things, and endureth all things. Why? Because charity, love, never fails. The important ingredients in the Christian home. And then finally, the advantageous home. A home that is built for success. A home that is built correctly. It's built correctly because the members of that home setting have implemented God's holy word. Listen again to what Jesus said in verse 24. Therefore, whosoever heareth these sayings of mine and doeth them, I will liken him unto a wise man a man who built his house upon a rock. And the rains descended and the floods came and the winds blew and beat upon that house. And it fell not, for it was founded upon a rock. Will troubles and trials come in our home lives? Absolutely. Absolutely. Are we going to be perfect at all times? No. No. But we can withstand the difficulties. We can withstand the trials and the pressures of life. Why? Because we have built it on the right foundation. I read in a book somewhere, it's this one right here, that Jesus Christ is our rock. And if we're building our homes correctly, we're going to build it on the Lord. Now, Secondly, what about the crumbling home? What are we talking about when we talk about a crumbling home? We're talking about a home that is literally sinking. In California, some of those homes out there have literally just given away and have crumbled and fell. And one of the reasons is because they have been built incorrectly. 
incorrectly. Either our homes are built correctly or they are built incorrectly. They are either built on the right foundation or they're built on the wrong foundation. Let's just talk for a moment about what Jesus said in verse 26 of our text, Matthew 7. Jesus said, And everyone that heareth these sayings of mine and doeth them not shall be likened unto a foolish man which built his house upon the sand, the wrong foundation. And the rains descended and the floods came and the winds blew and beat upon that house and it fell and great was the fall of it. What about a crumbling home? Here are a couple of reasons of why some homes are crumbling and faltering and failing. It's number one, it's because there is chaos in the home. Now there are some homes that when you look at them, you just admire them. When you see the husband and the wife and the mom and the daddy, the children, it's just a perfect fit. Everything seems to be working in harmony. It's like a fine running engine. But then there are some homes that are literally filled with chaos. When you look at those homes, everything is out of sync. Nothing is running smoothly. A chaotic home lacks leadership. Every organization has to have leadership. I want you to think about the church for a moment. What if the church lacked leadership? Where would we be without leadership? God in his infinite wisdom said that from a universal vantage point that Christ would serve as the head of the church. Now Paul said just as Christ is the head of the church, the husband is the head of the home, Ephesians 5.23. Now, if there's not leadership in the home, then there's going to be a disarray, right? There are some organizations, there are some corporations across this country, they are floundering. They are failing. They're going into bankruptcy, all because they lack leadership. There are a lot of incompetent people serving as leaders. But by the same token, we, there are some individuals who are husbands, in the home that are not fulfilling their responsibility, their duty. They have abdicated their leadership position. Whenever there's not leadership in the home, well, there's chaos. And chaos will ensue. You can just mark it down. You know, I think about what Paul said in Ephesians 6, 4, when he said, And ye fathers, provoke not your children to wrath, but bring them up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. That to me says that a father is to be the spiritual leader of the home. Very much so. Look at some of the children today and the problems that youth are experiencing today. One of those problems is that they lack a father. They lack a godly father setting forth the right example. And they lack the right instruction in the home. And then we wonder why this nation, this country is floundering. We wonder about the moral ills of our society. I can tell you why our country is in such a bad, sad shape. It's because many of us as fathers have abdicated our responsibility. We talk about deadbeat dads, and it seems to be that there's a lot of deadbeat dads in our country today. They are worthless. And the reason that they are worthless is because they're not fulfilling their God-given responsibility. And it might even reflect back on their parents or grandparents. Sometimes we are hard on the mother. And, but we need to be hard on some daddies. We need to be hard on some fathers because they're not fulfilling their responsibility in the home. Did you know that God will hold us accountable for that? But then secondly, there's a lack of learning in the home. We talk about biblical aptitude. We, we want our children to go to the right school and to learn and to grow in, intellectually. We want to see them excel in the classroom. There's nothing wrong with that. All of us want that as parents. We're proud of our children when they do that. I've seen the bumper stickers on the back of some cars. 
But I want you to think about when it comes to their spiritual soul. How come we are not just as adamant about that as we are about their intellectual in the physical school? You go back and you read Hosea 4.1 where Hosea indicated that the children of God because he said there is no truth nor mercy nor knowledge of God in the land. If you were to poll the average child in our country today about the fundamentals of divine truth, they would have no idea of what you are talking about. None. Not even an idea. There was a day and a time in this country when the Bible was allowed even in the classroom, at the school. We know it's allowed in this classroom up here. But in the school, there wasn't a time that they didn't break open that Bible and read some scriptures and go over what they had just read. But that day and time is gone, hasn't it? We use the Bible to teach character and integrity. And we wonder today why young people are stealing and killing and why they are abusive toward one another, why they use profane language, why they just act like a bunch of heathens. They will go out rioting and looting when they don't get what they want. Why? It's because we as parents have not taught them God's holy word. And we're paying a terrible price for that even today. And then Hosea gets to verse 6 of chapter 4. And he says, my people are destroyed for the lack of knowledge. The knowledge of God's word. That's why our nation is being destroyed today. A lack of knowledge of almighty God in his word. And secondly... If the home has been built incorrectly, there will be chaos, but there will also be corruption. If you want to pollute your home, then just add these vices. Number one, apathy. Apathy and indifference robs the church. The church is comprised of people. But when we, as members of the body of Christ, are apathetic, and lukewarm in our Christianity, what are we saying to our children? We're headed for trouble, aren't we? We lack teaching for our children to learn what is right. But also in the home. Not just in the church, but in the home. When we become apathetic and indifferent, spiritually speaking, we're inviting the devil into our homes. Here's what Paul said. Neither give place to the devil in Ephesians 4, 27. And yet we open the door wide when we turn a deaf ear to what God has said. And yet many homes are trying to serve not just two masters, but multiple masters, because Jesus said, no man can serve two masters. Matthew 6, 24. Jesus said, you need to make a choice here. You are apathetic in your spiritual life. Here are some things that you will follow, potentially adultery. Look at how many homes today that have been torn asunder because of adultery. We've got people today that are not just adulterers, They are serial adulterers. And by that I mean that they are engaging in numerous adulterous relationships. Why is that? It's because there's chaos in the home. And chaos leads to corruption. Corruption is a result of apathy, adultery, then also alcohol. Let me tell you that at any time that you bring an open container of alcohol in your home... You have just invited trouble in your home. I can't can't make it any plainer than that. The, The Bible says that wine is a mocker, strong drink is raging, and whosoever is deceived thereby is not wise. 
Proverbs 20 and verse 1. I hear people try to rationalize the consumption of alcoholic beverages by looking at even John 2. Oh, they'll say, well, you know, Jesus turned water into wine. He would never have turned in a water into a alcoholic beverage. No way. If he did, he caused those people to sin at that wedding in Cana of Galilee. And if he caused them to sin, he sinned. And thus cannot be our Messiah. But yet, the Bible says that he knew not sin. And neither was guile found in his mouth. Now, if that's not true, then we can't even trust this book at all as well. And then we're wasting our time this morning. We can go out and enjoy and run around in the rain. But no, we have a purpose to be here, to learn and to understand and to know. Greed is also at the core of the rottenness of our society today. Jesus said, take heed and beware of covetousness, for a man consisteth not in the abundance of the things which he possesseth. Luke 12, 15. Just add to that gambling. I've heard of all the arguments. I know what people think about playing the, the lottery, going to the casinos, and all of this kind of stuff. Anytime that you bring gambling and greed into your home, you're headed for trouble. Just mark it down. Look at all the marriages that have failed because of a compulsive gambling. You will never have a problem with something you don't try. But if you get involved in gambling, you'll have to start going to the casinos. And before you know it, you're going to be hooked. The Bible talks about good stewardship. And gambling is not good stewardship. Gambling is not preaching, practicing the golden rule based on Matthew 7, 12. And there are some that want to legitimize gambling. They want to talk about how it's acceptable, how it's okay. But Jesus said, beware of false prophets. Matthew 7, 15. If someone tells you that gambling is acceptable in the eyes of Almighty God, you need to run. Run far away from them. Because it's going to lead you down a, a rabbit hole that you can't find yourself back out. And you don't want to go there. The third and final is the collapse of the home. If you want to make sure that your home is run right, following the Word of God, if you want to see your home collapse, just ignore what God has said in His Word. Listen again to what Jesus said in Matthew 7. And everyone that heareth these sayings of mine and doeth them not shall be likened unto a foolish man which built his house upon the sand and the rains descended and the floods came and the winds blew and beat upon the house and it fell and great was the fall of it. Two choices. It's either a Christian home or a crumbling home. What about you today? What kind of home are you building? That's right. What is the state of your home today? I want to close by citing an Old Testament example in the book of 2 Kings. Here we read about Hezekiah, who was one of the good kings of Israel. And some people from Babylon had come. And and it tells us that when they came to meet with him, that he showed them all the treasures of his home. I, I want you to see just how wonderful all these treasures are. I mean, just... It just, it's almost endless, right? And so Isaiah, the prophet, went to Hezekiah and he asked him this question. What is it that they see in your house? And Hezekiah responded by saying, all that was in my house, I showed them. When people look into your home, what is it that they see? Do they see a Christian home or a crumbling home? And they're either going to see one or the other. If you're here today and you're not a Christian, if you're watching online, can we encourage you to make things right? 
Can we encourage you to become a child of God, to come to Christ, believing that he is the son of God, repenting of your sins and then making that good confession that he is the Christ, the son of the living God, and then go down into the waters of baptism to rise to walk in newness of life, a New Testament Christian. We hope that you'll let us know even today. And if you're already a child of God and you wandered away, can we pray with you? Can we help you in any way to get out of that sin and that you will pray to God for that forgiveness that is necessary? We hope that we can help you even even this morning.